Hi, and welcome to IN, a series of live online conversations with practitioners in the visual arts. IN is broadcasted by New Local Space, a micro gallery and contemporary art initiative here in Kingston, Jamaica, and a subsidiary of audio production house Creative Sounds. Our 2014 programming is sponsored in part by Creative Sounds Limited, Transformer in Washington, D.C., and Alice Yard in Trinidad and Tobago. Tonight, we'll be talking with Malika Brooks Smith Lowe, our next full time artist in residence at MLS, about her plans for her residency. Malika Brooks Smith Lowe is a Grenada based artist and activist of Jamaican descent. She has exhibited her work across the Caribbean at spaces such as Trinidad and Tobago Film Festival, the Fresh Milk Art Platform in Barbados, Soul HQ here in Jamaica as well as several other spaces. She received a BA in Studio Art from Smith College in Northampton, Massachusetts. Malaika's residency at NLS will be a multimedia inquiry into her Jamaican maternal grandfather's very first memory of migration, his mother leaving him at the age of four, as well as the legacy and psychological impact of his experience. Um, Malaika, thanks for joining us. Thank you for having me. Um, before we get into any que into my questions for Malaika, I want to let those of you who are tuned in know that we'll be accepting questions throughout the segment. So please send them in as soon as you can via Twitter. Our handle is NLS Kingston on Twitter, or you can send them um, on Facebook via private message at or at the NLS Facebook page or at the event page for um for this broadcast. Um, so, Malika, I'm just going to get right into it. Okay. First off, uh, we are very excited to be having you here in December. You'll be working on a personal or intimate project about your grandfather and his experiences as a child. Um, can you tell the audience, can you tell all of us a bit more about the project, what the format, the final exhibition, um, what you envision for the final exhibition after your residency? taking and what kind of material the project will be drawing from. Yeah, sure. Um, well, first of all, thank you for having me. I'm sorry about that technical difficulty. Um, okay. But it's, you know, this project basically it's drawing from um, my grandfather whose name is Derek Brooksmith and he is from Yeah, you're chipping out, Malaika. Hello. It has to be a really great, loving family um, in Jamaica, but his mom migrated when he was four, and she went to work as a nurse, you know, which is actually quite a common profession for people to have left to go and do. But beyond that, you know, that story of um, children being left at home with family, with close friends, with whoever will agree to keep them when parents continue on to, you know, quote unquote, find a better life or whatever decisions they make around their economic viability. Um, that's a really Caribbean story. It's a really common story globally, but, you know, in the Caribbean context yeah. for sure, it's something that is, you know, not only familiar, it is really embedded into our understanding of ourself and our family. So um, this project really kind of seeks to connect with my grandfather more about this moment that he talks about of his mother leaving being a kind of um, a kind of seedling for uh, a really intense love-hate relationship as he describes it and as really it was because my, my great-grandmother just recently passed a few years ago and um, so you know it's that moment is what I'm drawing from um, and a lot I think can come out of that my grandfather and I have a very close relationship and even though I'm here in Grenada um, he and I really just have a great connection and when I used to live in New York you know that was wonderful and so to, to, to kind of use this project as a moment to explore part of what makes you know, my grandfather, who he is, um, and therefore who I am in a way, but also to paint a portrait of this person, you know, because he really, 
I think um, has a way of impacting the people that he meets and you know he's just a being who is alive and you know who has many emotions like anyone else and it's just yeah I think I'm really looking forward to the opportunity to paint a portrait and by paint a portrait I definitely don't mean painting because <laughs> I think the drawing was like probably one of my lowest grades in college. <laughs> I mm -hmm. took it so that I could go on to take photography and video and everything. But I mean painting a portrait, um, using video, using audio. Um, I really want to explore um, more installation in my work because um, that's something that has always informed my video work, thinking about space and projection. But um, it's only in undergrad where I had the room and the the kind of uh, context within which I felt comfortable exploring installation with objects as well. So I'm actually really interested in thinking about, um, you know, I'm not really familiar with the landscape of where I'll be in Jamaica, so it's good to have, you know, six weeks to kind of get to know a little bit of what I'm dealing with, but I imagine that I would like to collect um, discarded objects, you know, found objects in the sense that it's kind of, I'm looking, my eye is open for household items, things that belong in a home domestic space in a way. A part of me is really interested in this idea of kind of feeling, um, this feeling of being discarded or stored away that my I think my grandfather kind of had and... Mm -hmm. Yeah. So have you always worked in such a a personal yeah. way. Mm -hmm. Excuse me? Have you always worked in such a personal way? It's um, a very intimate project. Have you always worked in such a personal way? Yeah, well, I... Um, Make, making work that's so informed by... Yeah, well, I definitely uh, have... I think, you know, I, I'm thinking about this question and it... it, it it's personal, but it's often not so direct and not so um, overtly. Mm -hmm. And I'm not even sure that the outcome of this project is going to be very overtly, um, you know, about my specific grandfather. I mean, that's how I envision it now, but I'm not sure because, you know, it could take many different forms based on also who I meet and connect with in Jamaica. but. You know, I think that the seedlings, the kind of main starting ideas of um, of my pieces definitely tend to be personal. Um, you know, I can think about the last, you know, one of my pieces um, in the past two years that really started out of some really personal questions about, um, you know, relationships with family members in my life and observing different family members. And, you know, that's where that piece came out of and it became something that was a bit more broad and general but yeah I think that the things that are closest to me are the things that I think about most and therefore mm -hmm. want to kind of uh, explore visually yeah so when did you Malika when did you start developing the idea for this residency project I know we um, the residency a lot of people may not know but the um, there is a, a quite a period between the um, application process and then when the residency actually starts at NLS. So, you know, you you applied um, several months ago um, and, I'm, and I'm assuming that you are speculating that you probably have had the idea for the residency um, ruminating in your mind or at least developed to some point conceptually. Yeah. Um, when did you start developing this idea? Um, well, I think that yeah, you're right. There's definitely a big amount of space, and I and I had to keep it secret that whole time, which was also very <laughs> challenging for me. I'm very talkative, um, <laughs> but uh, so I was excited to announce it just recently, you know. <laughs> anyway, uh, but I've always, I think not always, but in the past couple of years, you know, my grandfather as a character, for lack of a better word, but really as this, you know, this is this man who's in his 70s who still bikes around Brooklyn, bikes over to Manhattan, like goes to the YMCA gym, is like just doing wow. his thing. Wow. And, yeah. And, you know, 
and of course he's aging. He over time, I'm seeing it more and more. But he's still just doing his thing, listening to public radio, you know, calling us with snippets of things that we should look up online, and like, you know, just kind of still so present and there that he, you know, the past few years, because he also is the person who really. Um, gave me permission to be a creative being, to be an artist. You know, he always had sketchbooks around and a lot of art in his apartment, but he sketches and doodles and and writes these little, you know, phrases and poems. And, and so he would give me sketchbooks. And um, it was something that also allowed me to express myself, not even just artistically. Like, I was looking back on one of the sketchbooks um, recently as I was kind of doing research for this project, and I saw, you know, just teen angst. <laughs> you know, just like total moments where the page is like ripped, and I'm just totally... But it was kind of this safe space to be myself, and I feel yeah. that he has always provided that. So in the recent years, I've been thinking about this interview. The interview that I did with him that I um, informed this project was done in 2010. So since 2010, there have been a few snippets from these interviews that I did with people in my family about migration. It was about, um, yeah, the project was a research paper for my master's in cultural studies about kinship and migration and how like transnational relationships kind of sustain or don't sustain and the ways that technology impacts that kind of came up too. And so since 2010, that's when these interviews happened and this has then been ruminating um, yeah. as a project. Very cool. So you, speaking of migration, you are currently based in Grenada. Right. Is this where you were raised? I mean, you mentioned that your grandfather is biking around Brooklyn, so <laughs> <laughs> obviously in New York. And um, and we know that part of the background of this project is that his mom migrated and his well his mom his mom left him or he got separated with his from his mom. What can you tell us a little bit more about the your personal um, experience of uh, migration? How you ended up being being in Grenada if your father is from Jamaica and all of that? Just a little bit of your biography. Yeah. So well, my. Uh oh, we lost Malaika for a second. Malaika, just so you know, we're not so I started with her. Wait, we didn't hear you. We huh? didn't hear her like about. Okay. Um, we didn't hear you so for about maybe I don't know ten seconds, so we missed the whole. Okay, can you hear me now? Yep. Okay. So basically, because of my parents, um, my mom ended up here in Grenada um, because of the Grenada Revolution. So she moved here when she was a teenager with her parents, and um, it was with her mom and her stepdad. And it, her stepdad, Don Rojas, was um, went to school with Morris Bishop in secondary school here. And so, you know, when the revolution happened, uh, he moved back to Grenada and um, began to work, you know, as one of the people in terms of dealing with the press and uh, that kind of thing. So they were really involved in what was going on. And my mom moved and, and started secondary school here. And then once she graduated, she also was very much involved in... Um, being a part of the revolution and my parents met you know working in one of the ministries during that time and uh, when right now actually is the kind of memorial anniversary of the assassination of Morris Bishop and his comrades on October 19th and then on the 25th is when the US invaded so we're right in the center of this really intense moment emotionally in the country um, as we speak and so this in in this moment now, uh, in 1983, you know, my parents actually are prob were probably in the building that I'm in now because I'm renting an apartment in the house that my dad grew up in, and yeah. so they probably were in this building now that I think about it, um, kind of thinking what the hell is about to happen because after the assassinations there was a mandatory curfew, everybody was held down, so 
you know. So then, long story short, the invasion happens, or intervention, or intervasion, as I called it in my thesis, because people mm -hmm. really have to change. Um, that happened. Um, my mom, as a U.S. citizen, got whisked away with her family. And, you know, there are these journals that she, these kind of a few pages that she wrote to my dad over the days where she didn't know how to reach him, all the circuits were down, she had no idea what happened. And instead of moving on with her parents, um, they went to Cuba and on and on, she came back to Grenada, you know, and she, that's how she started her life here with my father. Yeah. And... Um, and from there, we live back and forth between the states and here. I mean, only because my mom uh, was doing, you know, her medical practice, well, her, her medical school. So she did medical school here um, mm -hmm. and then was doing her residency. So I was in New Jersey from age about 4 to 11. I grew up in New Jersey um, and then moved back here for secondary school and then moved back to the States for college and worked, you know, in New York for a while. <clears throat> and actually it was towards the end of college that I really, I knew I wanted to move back to Grenada, <laughs> but I didn't necessarily know that I wanted to do so immediately per se. But towards the end of college, what happened was I really started to recognize that the activism that I was doing at Smith College, where I did my undergrad in Massachusetts, you know, it was making an impact what we were trying to do as activists in the college. You know, we got Coca-Cola as a company. We got our school to kind of divest from Coca-Cola in that sense and um, renew their contracts with the local company because Coca-Cola had all these human rights violations. And we were doing all kinds of activist work on campus. And what I was realizing was that I felt that I could have more of an impact here, you know, and it felt like it made more sense to be here in Grenada and to be connected here and it just felt like, you know, I was struggling to just eat basic fruits and vegetables out there because it just didn't taste like what my dad grows and there's just so much lushness, there's so much um, there's, it's the perfect environment for me here. So why not be where I feel most alive and where also with 100,000 people, there is so much more room to have an impactful voice and to work collectively with others to elevate all voices, you know? Um, so it felt, it felt like it made so much sense to be back here and, um, you know, I must say that it's not easy moving back home and a lot of people say I want to but 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 and I know like you know I have a student loan in the states that is hard to keep up with sometimes and I have you know but I think I think being able to calculate that I have enough support here to allow to allow myself to just take the risk and come home I had people ask me if I was deported because they were like what what is Why it? Moving back to Grenada, you must have been forced. Yeah. <laughs> Why would a 23-year-old, you know, decide to move home of their own volition? And I think the stars, you know, not the stars aligned, but yes, it seemed like things made sense. And you know, also being certified um, right before I left, the year before I left, I became certified as a yoga teacher. And um, my mom was in the process of wanting to open a studio. She had done her certification um, recently. And uh, so that was another, it was like this whole niche that was kind of unexplored at the time. And even now there's more studios, et cetera, but it's still this small space that really is my bread and butter. I teach, you know, on average I teach between 16 and 20 classes, workshops, sessions per week, privates and groups. So that's a lot, <laughs> you know, um, but it, it works out. It works out and allows me to do my activism and community development work. It allows me to do some film and photography stuff still, but it's just a balancing act. So coming to NLS is going to be great because I'll be able to step back from that day-to-day -day and really focus in on the project. Mm -hmm. yeah. so, so sometimes um, going into, um, to, because you already started speaking about it from a, a bigger picture, um, you've already gone in that direction, so um, let's continue on that. I want to I want to ask you more questions in that area. So I know that sometimes in the art making process, the I'd say the most productive space sometimes is a meditative one where you know you're not trying to pin down too many concrete thoughts as the work develops. You know, um, but 
but what would you would you be able to tell us what you think some of the larger sociological implications of this of your project? Because um, I know you have an activist bent to you. Um, do you do you see this project that you're doing at NLS um, having some larger sociological implication in your mind? Well, I think that um, you know, hmm. I think right. that everything. I guess <laughs> my answer to that is. Like everything ends up being political, right? Like every single thing is somehow connected to <laughs> like issues of sociology and power, et cetera, of course. <laughs> you know, so yes. And I think some of the issues that I'm interested in because, you know, I don't want my I'm not really interested in my work being created in a vacuum or in this like pristine space where it's looked at for its aesthetic value and oh you know I think it is really about dialogue and conversation what what comes up for people how do people connect who how do people see themselves or see an other in this and what does that start to to trigger and some of the issues for me definitely you know thinking about migration again I just don't think that on a in terms of the larger public discourse there's not a conversation about how migration affects us emotionally no one's talking about the fact that you know the average person who lives here right now has close family and friends who are just not here you know mm -hmm. and in a globalized and more and more globalized world I guess that's more and more common but you know it is still what it is, and I think when 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 migration gets talked about, it's often talked about in relation to brain drain, in relation to you know losing. I mean, I think yeah. it's, the percentage here, the latest I've heard is 85 percent of our college-educated Grenadians do not live here. Yeah, and I think even when you speak about globalization and migration, when you compare um, migration and globalization uh, between uh, developed countries, you know, yeah. you don't get that drain, that potential drain of like gross domestic product that, right. you know, you, from places, from nations that, I mean, when you start pairing it down to actual nations and people, the migration out of nations um, that are poor, and um, and the productivity and as you say the um, capital intellectual capital and a lot of that stuff you know you really start wondering if it accept if it affects the gross domestic product of that country and then again of course it's going towards where the money already is right um, so it's not just a family separation thing it's also tends to be to accompany an economic situation where you're leaving um, family that's less well off, and I, again, that's not even really always the case in these contemporary times. But absolutely, because I mean, the the other the other reality is that people are not talking about how they're flipping, struggling in the global north. You know, because the the idea is that you're supposed to go up there and you're supposed to live the life, and of course, we like to live the life on social media you know, um, in the sense that it's a performance. So we perform our happiest, best self usually, or, you know, we can also perform our rants. But the point is that if you go up to the States, you, the, oftentimes it doesn't seem like we're talking about the realness of what that is, of dealing with, you know, rent <laughs> and paying first, last, and security and dealing <laughs> with all these other, you know, dealing with credit card debt, which is a lot of what ties people up in the States, is debt. So you get stuck in this debt and paying your credit card bill from Grenada, you know, when you're making EC dollars is almost unviable for the, the base general salaries, you know, that people are making. So I think it's also about, you know, when people migrate, we're not always talking the realest story for whatever reasons, you know, for whatever expectations that we have and others have. And so, you know, that also ties into 
the whole, you know, um, when you're talking about in these recent times where people are not necessarily leaving a less well-off situation per se, you know, sometimes it ends up being tougher where they go. And, um, you know, it's hard when I think sometimes we don't count the value in an economic and emotional sense of having, you know, living in a community with distant, you know, extended family and, you know, um, just more... A uh, social net, yeah, like yeah. having that social net, that safety net socially, yeah. Exactly. So in terms of some of the larger issues, now, yes, there's the economic, et cetera, and I think that that is deeply connected to what, um, to what I want to do, but I do think that the emotional is not talked about as much as the economic, et cetera. So that's kind of what I'm interested in a little bit. What does it mean, you know, for my grandfather as a little boy to feel all these emotions, to feel abandonment, to feel all these things, and to have to go to school and to have to be a good boy at home and do his chores and just be a happy little boy, you know, when he's feeling all these different things. And, you know, um, and, and it makes me think about how our young boys are not encouraged to feel. You know, my mom is a, besides being a yoga teacher, she's also a physician, and she talks about sometimes the fact that with some parents, she sees that if it's a little girl, they bring the girl in if she's sick. But oftentimes, um, not I, I don't want to say often, but in some instances what she sees is that with little boys, there's this idea that they're supposed to be tough, you know, they can, like, get through a little something that they're feeling, but people are quicker to bring the girls. And, you know, in a way, it's that kind of starts to show this idea that, you know, our men are not supposed to be feeling, that the only emotion that's, that's allowed is anger. And I think my granddad has and has had a lot of anger about things and about that situation that, like, kind of just snowballed, right, over time. So if we don't allow for this release for our boys um, and our men, then how does that energy get translated? How does it get moved? How does it get unstuck, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So so would you say then that that is the driving force behind, and I know you, you mentioned um, painting a portrait of your grandfather, would you say that those are the main driving forces behind your residency project, do you think? Um, I think some, yeah, I think some of those things are, I, I, yeah, I think that those definitely are some of the issues that I have in mind, and I think, I just want to also, the more that I start to talk to people about the project, I'm interested in their, um, experiences of migration or experiences of, you know, feeling, what feelings are associated with losing a parent or a child, and not losing, but, you know, <laughs> losing is one word, yes, um, but having that feeling of loss, and so it would be interesting to see what other people have to say, because I think that often my projects do tend to have this interactive, and by interactive, in this case, I'm talking about in the process of it, because like I said before, I am, I am quite talkative, <laughs> and I enjoy conversation, I enjoy hearing people's stories, so hearing how it resonates with other people also, it becomes a part of the process, you know? Yeah. Um, yeah. What kind of challenges do you think, do you face, I mean, um, when you're making art from such a, an intimate or, I don't want to say in, intimate, because I guess all art making is intimate on, on some level, but from such a familial and personal space, what, what kind of challenges do you think do you face me? Well, I think that um, one of it, one of the challenges is the fact that, you know, we definitely have a don't air your dirty laundry kind of thing in the Caribbean. Mm -hmm. uh, so there's that because, you know, there's disrespectability, politics and whatnot. I think... In relation to my granddad, and, and I'm happy that it's this side of the family, I will just say candidly, <laughs> that yeah. I am happy that I'm um, exploring my mom's father's side versus my mom's mom's side. I love my nana, and I the, that side of the family has amazing work, work, like, you know, stories and things worth engaging with, but I feel like there are more people who are actively at stake there, you know, and who there's um, 
more dirty laundry that I feel like people care about and you know it's important and I want to honor how people feel about things in relation to my granddad's side you know there's less it's not as big of a family um, you know active and present in the states and I think so it makes it a little bit easier because you know my granddad also doesn't really have to think about other people because you know most of his elders have passed you know most of um, the immediate family that he has really besides his kids are not in his life anymore and have passed away so you know that then frees him up um, in a way that maybe he wouldn't <laughs> be in uh, if if that weren't the case and so in dealing with family that's one thing you know because it's so personal it becomes something that you have a stake in in a way that you have to be delicate with it which is okay um, you know and for me I think it's also gonna be important to step back you know to step back and see if what I'm doing um, still becomes relevant to other people because who knows I mean I guess whatever I make could be relevant in some way or another but Mm -hmm. uh, it could also just get super just personal and be just really relevant to me and him and not necessarily to anybody else, which could also be interesting too. <laughs> yeah. Being a visual artist, you're also thinking about a project from an aesthetic and visual communication perspective. Mm -hmm. What aesthetic cues would you say you're coming to this project with and, and who have been some of your influences artistically? Who have you been looking at? Yeah, so wait, can you say the first part of the question again? Um, what what aesthetic cues would you say that you're coming to the project with? Um, and who have been some of your influences artistically? Mm -hmm. um, well, I think that some of the aesthetic cues that I'm coming with, you know, some of the things that are coming to mind a little bit for me um, have to do with thinking about, like, street photography a little bit, thinking about, because I want to go to New York um, for a little bit before the residency to spend some time with my grandfather, uh, I do want to to kind of pick up on where he is, you know, he is in Brooklyn and that is a whole, you know, space that is very relevant to the story of Caribbean migration and so, you know, I think, I think about um, work, and we were talking about Tumblr before we came on live actually, but I'm thinking a little bit about work that comes out of that space where you're documenting this urban um, black space that can be really interesting, you know. Um, and in relation to thinking a little bit about some references for my work, uh, just that jumped out of me right now, and I know you had her on in before, but um, when I think about when I think about the Caribbean as a space that feels that has that isn't just this Caribbean utopia, this like beautiful postcard image, I think about Nadia Huggins and mm -hmm. like the the kind of I think there was an article that referred to her work as like talking about the shadows, you know, and there is this there is this sense of emotion and just that even when I feel like even when people are not being shown um, in an image that that Nadia makes there is this feeling that there are people and they feel <laughs> I don't know how to explain it any more than that but um, but there's that and then you know someone else who comes to mind in terms of their work and and how it kind of stimulates me is LeVar Monroe um, who, who is out of Bahamas, I believe. Yeah. Yeah, and he, um, there's something about his, his work that feels like it lends itself to installation, too. Like, it has this, like, multidimensionalness, and there's, there's kind of all these layers and pieces, and I, I kind of, I'm drawn to that aesthetic in a way. Uh, mm -hmm as well. So those are two people that come to mind just off the top of my head. Very cool. Um, well, I like that you're, you can cite your contemporaries as influences. Yeah, well, and I also think it's important because, you know, right now, I mean, for me, 
it I don't even want to say it was a pleasant surprise because I don't think I really thought about it not being the case that there was a creative community here but you know when you're in a place like when you're in college somewhere else or when you're in a place like New York where there are all these different little scenes of creative stuff happening and even though many of the people that I engage with were people who were of the Caribbean and African diaspora it felt very disconnected to what's happening here and I'm, I wonder if it's feeling more and more connected now because I do think that things like Tumblr, etc., Instagram do start to connect us a little bit more um, visually and with visual work but mm -hmm. I do think that you know, when I was there I didn't really know what was happening here and so then coming down and, and becoming aware of entities like ARC, entities like NLS and you know like Fresh Milk and all these spaces, Alice Yard, that are trying to engage across the region and then the film festivals too, I mean it's beautiful so it is, it is really amazing to have contemporaries who I can say yeah you know this work is is something that, that that kind of just stimulates my thinking and resonates with me in a way. Um, so, so yeah, that's that's really it's a blessing to have that and to know work from across the region. <laughs> yeah, sound is also a component of your upcoming project. Um, how will, how will that how will sound be playing a part in the project, playing a role in the project, and have you ever worked with, with sound before in any of your other installations? Um, so have I ever worked with sound and what was, I'm sorry, the first part uh, of it? I really was just giving it as a lead in and telling oh. the audience that sound is going to be a component of your yeah. project, your residency project. And how, I'm asking you how, how it will come in and have you ever worked, in, worked with sound before in your installations, previous installations? Yeah. Um, Okay, so in terms of installations, uh, sound has not really come in um, previously. However, in relation to some new media work, you know, with some, some experimental video, yes, sound has been really a part of what it is that um, I'm engaging with. And I think that with this piece it's going to be interesting to see you know how much video becomes a part of it um, and how much audio does because this conversation I mean the original conversation I had with my granddad in 2010 really does um, still it's just so beautiful like something about it still is so striking for me uh, and I think that I am being more and more drawn to the idea of a soundscape and I think you know, in my yoga classes too, actually, um, making making a soundscape is part of the process because I often make playlists and you know the class is kind of curated <laughs> in a way, and yeah. so um, so there are these moments of me dealing with sound. You know, through the two films I made in the past two years, um, sound was a part of what was happening. And it was this kind of, it wasn't sound that was like dialogue of what was going on. It really was like sound, like sound, music, moments of just kind of different sound interventions. So um, I'm interested in to continuing that process and thinking about, you know, sound without video possibly or, you know, sound with still images. And it's, I guess with this project right now what it is is the concept and then there are these there's this whole kind of handful of possible visual approaches and I I think it's gonna be really instrumental as the weeks go on and as I take the time with my grandfather before the residency to start fleshing out because there's so many possibilities to start really honing in um, on how this particular story, like what approach would be best. And I think I appreciate being an artist who works um, in across a couple dif disciplines because it does give me the space and room to feel to, to feel out what suits the concept, you know? Yeah. So, so now is that time to really start thinking about, you know, how much 
of what element goes in. But I do, I really, the idea of it being multimedia in and of itself is something I'm really committed to. So mm -hmm. I do want to find a balance between objects and sound and <laughs> visuals, if I can. Um, especially because of what I've seen of the NLS space, just from pictures, it seems like this um, really lovely kind of contained space that could possibly be transformed. Like it's, you know, it's not so huge that you can't transform the whole thing. So a part mm -hmm. of it is really tempted to transform the entire space to feel a different way because you can kind of step into it like this capsule, right? Absolutely. And I was also going to say, um, in relation to the site specificity of it, is that um, we're literally attached yeah. to a recording studio to Creative Sounds. And I want, I know, has that influenced at all how you've thought about sound fitting into the project? Um, have do you see sound? I know you mentioned sound being a part of your video projects, but in that way, it there is a sort of tends to be a sort of linear narrative when you have sound attached to, to yeah. video. Yeah. I don't know if you plan on untethering it for your for your residency, but I wondered if um, if being associated with an audio recording studio has influenced in any way how you've seen sound fitting into the project or how you're going to approach it from a yeah. technical standpoint. Well, that's a good point because, I mean, one of the things I had mentioned that I'm I'm trying to kind of do is I would really love to try to get my grandfather to actually come down and that would be really interesting to kind of have um, a studio space to kind of record some really clean crisp <laughs> you know audio with him um, and whether you know whether or not that ends up all or not being directly in the project but I definitely am interested in un untethering because I think that sound in a way, in a sense, has it's been, if I think about my video work, I feel like sound is bursting at the seams, like it wants to be free a little bit of the having to connect with this image somehow or, you know, um, yeah. have to be bound by the timeline of the video itself. So I think that I, I am ready to um, think about the ways that sound alone because one of my pieces recently I was listening to it I just like closed my eyes and I realized also that the sound was became so important to me like whenever I was showing it to someone on a like laptop to just show them I needed them to have headphones and I became it really became clear that the sound is its whole own thing you know with this piece so yeah I am I'm interested in thinking about the value of having a studio there um, and possibly documenting other stories of people who I connect with, whether it's in, you know, it would be amazing if I could do some exploration, because when you first said site specificity, I also thought you were thinking about in relation to my project, because for me, you know, this story is very much about my grandfather in, and his connection to Jamaica, and my connection to Jamaica in a way, but I haven't been in Jamaica since I was probably about eight. I actually went to school. I should find out what school I went to, but I went to school for a month because my wow. mom. Yeah, my mom was the kind of mom who was like, "Oh, you're gonna get a uniform and go to school if we're gonna be there for a month during the school year," you know. So, <laughs> so uh, I think my dad was in law school or something was something like that. Um, so we were there, and I lived there for a month. And but the point is that you know this project also is dependent on the exploration of this space, you know, the exploration yeah. of um, the spaces that were are relevant to this story as it is now. So that also is going to be interesting to see, can I find people that my grandfather knows or knew or are somehow, you know, part of this story of his and uh, see how that connects as well. Mm -hmm. You mentioned, um, you mentioned the shall we say, discrete size of NLS, and um, it's this contained uh, scale. What, um, and you know, and how, what that can permit you to, um, to really take it over in a certain way. Mm -hmm. uh, what, you know, thinking about that, are there any other reasons um, 
what was the main thing you were looking for in a residency and um, and specifically what brought you to applying to the one at NLS other than you know this, the way the space is laid out? Oh yeah, well I mean I have been following NLS uh, from I wonder if it's from the get-go, maybe from the get-go but what? for a while <laughs> and uh, you know it, it's it's I guess coming from the context within which I'm in here, you know, where we're running Groundation and we also are this um, this art space, but you know, mm -hmm. we have we're dealing with multiple issues. So while we host artist residents and deal with like creating, you know, art opportunities and creative opportunities, and we have this open call now for forgetting is not an option about the revolution. You know, yeah, we can you tell us, um, Malika, tell us a bit more of that too. You should, um, oh yeah, segment. Tell us about that open call, um, so people can apply to it. But yeah, I don't want to break you off track. Yeah, but I don't want to yeah. I'll try to remember to do that because it is exciting. <laughs> um, but the point is that with all of, you know, it's cool because Groundation. What I was telling someone recently, and I will talk about why I picked NOS, but <laughs> was the the fact that. It's exciting to see Groundation as a multi-issue organization in the region really being welcomed to all these different tables and being absolutely, like, 100% comfortable in all these spaces. You know what I mean? So as a feminist organization, as an organization that deals with sexual health and reproductive health, as an organization that's... Um, interested in policy change and constitution reform as an organization that's an, an arts organization that really is about engaging artists and critical conversations among artists, you know, it's really refreshing and exciting to see that something multi, you know, interdisciplinary can, can be relevant and make sense. And so watching NLS from the perspective of a fellow arts organization in that sense um, has been so wonderful to see the way that um, you guys are engaging with the kind of virtual world and having these in conversations which I've logged on to before um, and also seeing the way that you're engaging crowdfunding um, was really wonderful as well and I just thought it, it became such a perfect opportunity because of it being located in Jamaica also uh, because there have been moments in my life where I've said it, it could have totally been the other way. For some reason or other, it could have been that I was living in Jamaica as someone of Grenadian descent, you know, with my dad living in Jamaica too. It could have just flipped the other way. And, you know, generally, there's already so much. My last name is already double hyphenated. I've moved back and forth so many times to then add in that I'm all, you know, Grenadian, Jamaican, <laughs> you know, like... Um, artist, yoga teacher, it's just a lot. So the Jamaica has often gotten just left out of that story, but in reality, a huge part of my family, a huge part of my understanding of myself comes from the fact of my family being from Jamaica. So it's it's a really unique opportunity to engage with, with Kingston specifically um, and with uh, the creative community that's growing around NLS and around, I mean, just being an artist in the Caribbean since 2000, like moving back in 2010, I've met so many amazing creatives from Jamaica who are living and working in Jamaica and it's been such an incredibly refreshing experience to meet musicians, filmmakers, um, photographers and all these people who are just, and activists who are just lighting up the space that I you know, the NLS opportunity became so perfect and it came at a perfect time. And I liked that it was so much space because I could definitely block it out. Like, I can be at NLS for this residency, let me apply. You know, it gives you, the application date gives you enough time to fully make it concrete that you have to be at this thing, you know. Mm -hmm. um, and I, and it was it was enough time that I could warn my students because I have yoga students who you know I go for private classes I go two or three times a week and it's a consistent and vital part of my day because I get so energized by them but it's also an important part of them their life and so it gave me enough time to really prep people I will be gone for six weeks <laughs> um, because I do tend to travel here and there but six weeks is a big 
chunk. So yeah, um, there were a lot of things about the residency that drew me to it, and um, and it had a lot to do with the people associated with NLS and the broader creative community in Kingston. Cool. Have you? So we are about to embark on your fundraising over the next month. Mm -hmm. um, have you? And you just you just touched on that a bit. Have you had any experiences with crowdfunding before, or is this something that you look? Is this something you look on with excitement or trepidation, or both? <laughs> um, I nerve-wracking. You said what? It can be rather nerve-wracking. Yeah, yeah, it can be. But you know, um, I definitely have my fair share of experience with crowdfunding because, uh, well, as of this year. Well, only recently I stepped down as director of public relations of a project here called the Grenada Goat Dairy Project, and mm -hmm. that is this uh, nonprofit that uses goat dairy husbandry as a jump-off point for um, for dealing with issues of food security. Um, education in terms of agriculture and in terms of this holistic education that helps us to understand the, the critical importance of self-reliance and really growing your own food. And so that project, we had a, we had a fundraiser and it was on Kickstarter. It was, two, was it two years ago already? Yeah, this time, this time two years ago we were just wrapping up, I believe. Um, and we were trying to raise fifty thousand U.S. dollars for a uh, primary school project at the Grenada, Go well, at the St. Patrick Anglican School. We wanted to do like a goat house and outdoor classroom at this school. They already have a 4-H garden and a poultry unit, and the, um, the teacher, the prime, uh, the principal, the prime minister, the principal, Miss Alexander, is very, very open to this kind of work. So we actually raised over. Fifty thousand dollars, which was crazy, and it wow. was a lot of work. I mean, it was a whole lot of work, and I think that's something that maybe we we anticipated, but not even as much as we did. And um, but it ended up being really fruitful. And I think this was just after the Olympics, just after Grenada won their first gold, and we were watching Kirani James run and, like, win. So there were a lot of people who were watching this as, like, this second international win in a way, you know? Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. It, because it really is, that's the beautiful thing about crowdfunding. You can see something that you believe in go the distance. And when people were sharing it and people were really recognizing the power of, being able to say this is what I want and I'm gonna make it help make it happen you know as consumers we don't often recognize our power so it, it, it was really lovely to see people say yeah like this is what's gonna happen right now mm -hmm. um, and so yeah it was hard work we got we did a lot of footwork but it worked out so I, I definitely have a little bit of experience in the Kickstarter arena and I'm looking forward. <laughs> yeah, it was a lot, but I'm I am looking forward to this. It's a bit more bite sized, and I like this approach too. Where, you know, I, I really like the idea that um, NLS, the model that you're working with, where you, you know, are using it specifically as this way of bringing artists, because it just is easy to understand, you know, and it's very straightforward. And this is, and that was a big, I think, also the fact of this residency having funding support was huge for me, um, because, you know, as a young artist, as a young person who is working towards being economically sustainable, it's important to be thinking about, okay, how can I go to somewhere for six weeks? If you know I get some support to travel, etc. Okay, that makes it more possible. So it's it's really lovely to have this way of saying, okay, we don't have to be reliant on organizations and foundations. We can reach out to the people who want to see more work in the Caribbean, who want yeah. to see artists who are really trying to be connected to what's going on. So yeah, it's it's exciting. It's sort of a it's a contemporary notion of patronage. Is yeah, another way. And um, yeah, and then part of the whole process too is that people do end up owning an original piece of artwork after the after the whole process. So it really brings the whole idea too is to bring the public a lot closer to to what it means to support art and see directly the the consequences of that. You know. 
Mm-hmm. So I'm really, really uh, yeah, that's a really nice little added bonus for you that you have some um, experience with, with crowdfunding. <laughs> um, I don't have, we don't have any questions coming in from the audience yet. We just have one. Someone left a comment on our YouTube. Um, let's see what it is. Let's see. Oh, it was a comment from Annie Paul um, yeah. saying oh. that he, he's like, oh, you're related to... Don Rojas, I know him, probably met your mom when, when she was young. So, <laughs> so you probably have some catching up to do and some con- serious connections to make and um, when you're oh, here. So, I'm excited. Annie Paul is definitely one of those amazing, at least, well, for me, a virtual voice that um, I'm very, very excited to connect with in Jamaica. You know, And also, I mean, it's such a small world, right, because... Um, I don't know if Nicole Nicole Smythe Johnson, when she was in Trinidad and Tobago for the film festival last year, we mm-hmm. realized at some point she was we were talking and she was like, "Yeah, you know, it's funny. My sister's name is Malaika," and I was like, "Yeah, I'm named after a Jamaican Malaika." And then two seconds later, we realized that I'm named after her sister. You know what I mean? So mm-hmm. it's like I mean, I mean, small, beautiful Caribbean world. And I feel like Jamaica has always, I feel like Jamaica has, Jamaica has had a connection or felt a connection with Grenada, you know. Mm-hmm. From the time, I know that the Rev, the Grenada Revolution impacted a lot of developing nations, but I feel like Jamaica um, was well, like, I remember ahead. reading, I remember reading somewhere, well, no, I wasn't reading, it was one of my, um, one of my mentors here in Grenada who's a historian. Um, at the time where I was talking to her about my research, my thesis is about, well, was. I'm going to say was. <laughs> I finished that, and I just recently found out I received my master's in cultural studies, so yay. Congratulations. <laughs> Thanks. Um, but, it's 10 o'clock. Ooh, sorry. Uh, yeah, so, but... Uh, the so she was she when when we were dealing with my research, which is about memory and the revolution, um, she was telling me that it's really Jamaica that has at that time Jamaica was the only place where the textbook included the Grenada Revolution, not even Grenada. I mean, we don't have a local textbook to begin with. Wow. Um, but yeah, we don't have. Like, we just teach to CXC. There, there is one place in primary school, in one of the grades in primary school, the Grenada Revolution is dealt with, but when you read that section, it is so unage like, a, helpful. Like, there, it's just not... At that age, it just doesn't seem relevant. Like, some of it, yeah, but, like, a lot of it just seems like, why are we... This language doesn't seem relevant for this age. We should be teaching this later. Um, so Jamaica has been one of those progressive spaces in that way, and, and there are a lot of connections across the Caribbean with these radical movements that are so unspoken about and under... Um, kind of known in a popular sense. And that's why, I mean, leading into this project that we're, Groundation Grenada is collaborating with Arc, Arc Magazine on Forgetting is Not an Option. And it's a project that one of our co-directors, um, Kimberly Phillip, came up with l- this time last year. She um, was just coming out of a conference, uh, the Black Writers Caucus, I believe, and uh, you know, this topic came up of the revolution and, and for her to think about how can we start to create this archive of people's ideas and memories and thoughts on it, you know. There's this preoccupation with facts, but we really can't know the facts, you know. It's, and it's unfortunately ended in such a confusing way where, you know, half of the leading party was assassinated and people don't really know what the hell really happened and that's really hard for people but what we now want to say is you know how can we work with everything as the facts of how people feel and how people what people believe you know because even within one person what I realized in my research is that within an individual there are these conflicting views and ideas you know the revolution was conflicting (laughs) it was very much about human rights and democracy but yet you know, it definitely silenced people, and um, people who disagreed or spoke critically were handled um, very seriously, and that means, and understandably, in some ways understandable, with the threat of U.S. destabilization, with, 
you know, all of the things going on and the fact that these were young people trying to run a country. I mean, literally, we're talking about people between the age of 23 and 35, mainly, you know what I mean? So it was a lot of pressure, and um, so there were a lot of contradictions about that time. So this project seeks to invite people to use that as a jump-off point. It doesn't have to be directly about the revolution, the pieces that we're asking for across media, across you know disciplines. The deadline is the end of the month, and any work that connects to this idea of radical movements in the region, connects to this idea of history and memory, um, is welcome, and, and um, submissions from all over are welcome. Where do they send the submissions, Malaika? So we have a website called forgettingisnotanoption.org, and they can send their submission to submission at forgettingisnotanoption.org. And, uh, and I also want to encourage people that if you don't have a completed piece, if you're just hearing about this and the time is tight, what we want is also people to submit concept notes and drafts because, you know, we're launching next year, and we just want to know who is interested who's interested in being a part of this dialogue because we also have people who want to collaborate with people or we have you know folks who have you know um, pieces that they've done that how they want to translate into this space so I definitely encourage people even if um, you don't have something completed send us what you have and send us you know an idea of who you are so that we can start the conversation there because it really is the submissions that dictate what this ends up looking like um, so we want to have a virtual archive online but we also want to have live events we're going to be having a book launch um, from the work of Shalini Puri who's been leading research around memory and the revolution um, we're going to have public art and exhibitions and film screenings so we want but it also depends on what we get you know so which is really lovely because your work really then dictates the shape and the feel of this so uh, it's an exciting project we've been getting some great submissions you know we've gotten some academic writing we've gotten some audio pieces um, video and performance we've gotten a range of things so we want more <laughs> we want to encourage people to really Somebody was telling me they want to make a video game for it. I was like, okay, <laughs> that's interesting, you know. <laughs> so, um, so yeah, there's there's that project, and I think there's a lot of possibilities there. Very cool. Mm -hmm. Well, um, again, I'm gonna just do a little rove, and I don't see any questions coming in on Twitter, but I really thank you for for this great conversation, Malika. I think that. This will be um, one of those conversations that you know we can listen back to and really um, have a rich archive of information on on your work and and all the other activism that you're doing right now. Oh, thank you so much. I am I'm just very very excited to have the opportunity, just even being here with you tonight and having this conversation. You know, taking a moment to reflect is always useful for me and <laughs> everyone. I'm sure as you know in whatever work you're doing. So it is nice to have this moment to think about my creative practice, to think about the work that I'm doing, um, and to prepare to come. You know, the month, it's in just like a month and a half. Well, two months. Let me say two months. <laughs> kind of. Yeah, almost two months. Yeah, yeah, almost two months. So it's coming up, you know, so it also puts my head, like, focus on that. Um, and also just coming to NLS, I'm just so excited, and I'm looking forward to connecting with all of the artists there and also sharing that back through Groundation and through um, just, you know, wherever with people here because, you know, I don't think a lot of Grenadian folks, besides the music scene, you know, with people like Chronics and stuff breaking out on the contemporary scene, love his music, I, um, we don't really know what's happening in the creative community much in Jamaica, you know, so it would be nice to share, because um, that's always a big part of when I travel, I try to share, to share who these people are, what's going on, and so doing that in Jamaica and getting to interview and connect with people there is going to be really lovely, so thank you for that opportunity. You're welcome, and we look forward to seeing you. <laughs> me tell everyone who's, signed, who's tuned in, thank you for tuning in, and Malaika, you know you can share this, and anybody else who's tuned in, you can share this um, archive of the conversation, it's on our YouTube channel. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Have a good night. <laughs> night, night.